You're always out here, everybody. Uh, Bruce Arrell is my name, and I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce uh, an old friend and colleague, Dr. Suzanne Headwood, who describes herself these days as a neuroscience-based uh, coach. Um, Suzanne uh, is going to be talking tonight about the polyvagal theory. So, Suzanne, over to you. We're looking forward to the talk. Thank you so much, Bruce. I will share my screen and get going. For those of you who don't know me yet, <laughs> let me just give a little bit of an insight into who I am um, and how I guess I got to be here tonight. Um, I often forget the kind of more personal stuff when I'm uh, presenting, so I thought I'd actually start with that. I am a wife, a mum, a sister, friend, coach, and all of those things, and I use polyvagal in all of those I'm also a trainer and a speaker and a writer. And I know sometimes it's good to kind of go, has this person got any credibility at all? Or has she just been doing this for, you know, a weekend? Um, they're some of the books that I've either written or have contributed to. Um, and yes, I am trained in polyvagal informed therapy, which has been a bit of a game changer for me, really. Um, I come from healthcare background. I spent many years as a diagnostic radiographer, particularly in the trauma area, and I moved from that into education, culminating in New Zealand as ten year, nearly 10 years as an associate professor in health. And so I do have that sense of um, research and rigor that uh, I feel is important, and I make sure that everything that I do kind of has a research base to it even now. I guess as a neurological coach, a neuroscience based coach, I don't fit clearly into a box. Um, so I'm not a registered psychotherapist. I'm not a registered psychologist. I'm not so many things. And that can sometimes be challenging then um, as to where I fit within that wider patient pathway, I guess. Um, I'm also an avid learner. My PhD was in professional development and um, I'm constantly updating my own learning. So at the moment I'm on a breathing course that's the neuroscience of breathing. I put up that little copy of the slide from the symposium recently so that you can just see at a glance the range of tools I have in my box and polyvagal is just one of them. Happy if you look at any of those and you don't know what they are, then feel free, put it in a question for later on and I'll happily tell you what those tools are. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with 90% of them, if not all of them. So what I don't wanna to do today is spend too much time going back over the basics of polyvagal. Um, I'm gonna assume that you have a basic level of knowledge that you know about the autonomic ladder, for example, um, I do want to take that information and say, how can it be useful in general practice? So that's our focus for tonight. Of course, polyvagal is not new. It is, though, quite well established now, and it has been particularly applied within therapeutic disciplines to some great extent and great success. Obviously, it was Stephen Porges um, nearly 30 years ago that popularized uh, the, the theory, and then Deb Dana has taken that and taken it into, ther into therapy. So those two books, if you were gonna read a book by either of those, they would be my personal recommendation. Um, it's a newer one by Stephen Porges. I think it's much easier to read than some of his earlier work. And Deb Donner has written um, several books, but that one for me is the one that I would recommend if I was only gonna buy one. So, Polyvagal for me is about how do we create flexibility? How do we give patients or clients the ability to be able to move around their autonomic ladder safely and with some choice and with some ease? So I will just go over the absolute basics in case you've not come across it at all so that you at least know what we're talking about as I move forwards. Um, and also hopefully to inspire you to go and look up some of these if they're not familiar to you. So the first one in terms of core principles of polyvagal theory is that it's a hierarchy, that there are three levels usually um, spoken about, although I'm going to just challenge that a little bit and extend it slightly, and that we go up and down the hierarchy as we get stressed or as we come back to regulation. Deb Drana created the term autonomic ladder, and you'll often see pictures of a ladder with people walking up and down or in different states on various um, steps along the way. 
The second one I want to bring up is neuroception. I don't know if you're familiar with that terminology, but it was a term coined by Stephen Porges to indicate that the body is constantly, from a neurological perspective, scanning for potential threat. 24-7, it's looking for, is there a threat or a fear outside of me? Is there a threat or a fear inside of me? And is there a threat or a fear between me and somebody else? So there's those three components of neuroception. We're constantly scanning, often below our conscious awareness. And so the first thing we might hear or be aware of is when we drop down a ladder step, which if we're doing okay and we drop one level, we go into a sympathetic response, which might be fight or flight. Um, so neuroception, just to be aware that it's going on constantly, your body is built basically wired to keep you safe and um, it's the neuroception that's looking for that. And then the third one, a term called co-regulation, we can enhance our own regulation by doing it with somebody else. There's great strength in co-regulating with another person. Babies, um, you're going to be aware of this, they can't co-regulate, so they're reliant on their caregivers to give that to them. And likewise, some adults, certainly some of the adults I see in my practice, I largely work with stress and anxiety, people lose their ability or they forget how to self-regulate. And so I can get alongside them. I can co-regulate for a while to kind of remind them or teach them from scratch how they can move around that ladder again. One thing that I want to say that I think is important um, when we're using this in practice and it's quite a subtle, uh, it's not even listed as one of the core principles, but for me, it is core to my practice, is that at different steps or different stages up and down the ladder, our beliefs and our stories change. We hold different beliefs at different levels. And I'm going to come back to that when we start to look at some case studies. So if we just look at those three levels, the three autonomic states, um, again, just as a reminder for most of you, I imagine there might be one or two who haven't come across this yet, but that top of the ladder, we call it either ventral vagal or social engagement. And it's kind of a place of not perfection by any stretch, but I'm okay. The world's okay. I belong. I feel safe enough. I can do my job. I can connect with people. Um, so yeah, life is okay. But life happens, stresses come along and we drop. And when we drop, we go to that second level of the ladder, which is often called sympathetic or mobilization. It's getting ready to take some sort of action. Fight or flight are the two common terms that we use in, in that level. Um, they're often used as if it's one thing, fight and flight. Actually, physiologically and neurology, they're quite different. And so it's good to spot which the um, patient has gone into. So a patient who turns up in fight, for example, they may well get into an argument with you. They may well even get aggressive. Um, they might get into a conflict with you. Whereas a patient, if they've dropped into flight, may get up and walk away. Or they might just switch off and disconnect. You might suddenly find that they can't look at you, for example. They've lost that ability for eye contact. So it's really worth assessing which mobilized state they're in because your behavior will change towards them. Now, if that threat, whatever it was, stays around or it escalates and we drop again, we drop to the bottom of the ladder, which is called dorsal vagal or freeze um, at extreme. This is about dissociation, but it, there's like stages on the way to that. You might use words like withdrawal or collapse or fold down here. Life's a bit black. It's helpless, hopeless, disempowered. Um, you're going to start to get language like I can't. There's no point. So that's uh, one of the indicators down there. And remember how I said that the beliefs will change in different states. If you imagine maybe it's a patient newly diagnosed with cancer and they come to you for consultation and they're in dorsal vagal, they may well be stuck in the well, there's nothing I can do. There's no hope. They may not even show up to appointments. They might be so far within withdrawal that they don't even come along because in their mind, what's the point? They may well disconnect from family or friends and then they've got no support externally either. 
And at this stage, it's all driven by state that is then determining their beliefs. So if we can find a way to safely mobilize them up to a sympathetic or mobilized state, it may feel uncomfortable for them because they might feel anger or distress or sadness, but they're also now able to activate to take action. So you've actually given them a step in the right direction, even if that middle bit might feel very uncomfortable. And if we can then help them to get to the top of the ladder to some sense of regulation, whether or not it's calm or at least just making life feel manageable that they can again, uh, then again, you're changing the belief that or their belief will change with state so that they feel that they can do something about it. They can begin to whatever it is, get support, connect with other people, find out about what options are available to them. So listening out for those beliefs and calibrating where a patient's coming from, autonomically speaking, can help you to guide them around the autonomic ladder safely. So listening to their story is really, really key. And I do a lot in my practice around helping them understand what's happening, that kind of psychoeducation. And I use words like, this is normal, this is expected, this is a neurological response. Um, so that they're not sitting there thinking I must be broken or I'm crazy. If someone has dropped to that bottom level at dorsal vagal, it's because their body has reverted back to core safety and protection. And you can't just say to them, oh, you're OK, everything's all right, you're safe here, because that's not their perception and the body's not going to believe you. And so you kind of have to keep one hand in ventral vagal, meet them down in dorsal vagal where they're at acknowledge it, let them know that it is a normal neurological response so they don't dip into some form of guilt or shame um, and then work with them to gain a sense of safety back and only once that safety has returned will they be able to go back up the ladder in that flexibility. So as I say much of this for me ends up in a, a form of psychoeducation with clients helping them to really come up with a plan and that plan will be different if it's rising from dorsal vagal or if it's rising from sympathetic or um, mobilized. So letting them know how they come out of each of those, which is quite different. I also make sure that all my clients are aware that all of those states, all of those levels have a good function. They have a purpose. Um, it's certainly not about always being at the top of the ladder, um, never moving down. It's about having choice. So recognizing where you are and then having a choice about whether that's a good place for you to be right now. And if it's not giving them the, the um, skills to be able to, to move around it. And we can blend states. It's not as simple as three separate um, areas. We can absolutely blend states. And um, for example, if I do a little bit of dorsal vagal, but with ventral vagal, that feels like nice, quiet, safe stillness. It might be where I might meditate or do my mindfulness or go and float. I'm a great fan of flotation tanks. OK, so I hope that just brings you up to speed with a little bit of reintroduction, maybe to, uh, to the polyvagal um, theory and what we're talking about tonight. And really what I want to do then is to go into those three models in a little bit more detail. Um, through a slightly adapted model that I've created that does bring in some of those blended and adapted states because the reality is they show up in practice. So if we start at the top, um, we talked about ventral vagal where life is okay, but there's also beyond that, there's even better than that. There's life is great and life is awesome. And some people, that's where they live their life from. For others, they'll go there occasionally for some, they may never go there. And certainly most of the patients or clients that come and see me are not in that place, but it's worth knowing that it's there. And for yourself, um, considering if you're doing life okay at the moment, how could you make it even better and move into thriving? If we drop into sympathetic again, I, I split fight and flight into two different um, feelings, awarenesses, experiences, and they do feel quite different in the body. So helping somebody to feel into each of those so that they recognize them and recognize when they're beginning to drop into them is really useful. You'll see on the right hand side in blue that there's also this blended state between ventral vagal and 
sympathetic or mobilized. And this is, um, it's kind of a, a great way of putting energy into that ventral vagal. So it might be things like sport or uh, Chicksink Mahai's flow state, high performance states, uh, competition. So we can blend those states together um, and that just slightly complicates the map, but I think it's important to have that there. So if your uh, patient comes in and they seem mobilized, don't immediately assume that they're in a stress response because they might actually be in that um, mo motivated, I guess. Yeah, mobilized and motivated state, which would be a really useful place to have them in. Again, if I go down to dorsal vagal, I split into this sense of withdrawing as a verb and then ultimately the freeze completely collapsed, fold, whatever word that you're you're wanting to use in that more extreme, ultimately dissociated place. So it is a bit more of an intricate model than you normally see. Um, I think it's important to work with that so that I can work with the complexity of people that come in and uh, I just let them know it's not as simple as step one, two, three. If it was that easy, they would have sorted it out and they wouldn't be there asking for help, really. A couple of other stress responses around that you may have heard of that are not true neurological responses, but are adaptations that we create. Um, one is that top red line, the P's a please or for P's and a please warning or attach and cry for help. It's a stress response, but it's your nervous system's attempt to get back to ventral vagal. So please include me, please like me, let me be your friend, or let me do all that work for you, even though I'm already overwhelmed. It's a stress response to try to kind of hold on to ventral vagal. And if you go down to the bottom of that middle um, row, then you've got feigning or playing dead where again, it's not a full on withdrawal neurological response, but you adapt your nervous system and just let me disappear so that I can cope. Let me become invisible at work because it's too difficult. Let me go off the radar for a while. So it's a deliberate action. Um, and of course you can go from there into a full on dorsal vagal response. The other one that I haven't mentioned is that purple one down the side, and I mentioned it earlier, it's this beautiful combination of the two, ventral vagal and dorsal vagal, the two extremes, and it's that, yeah, that lovely safe stillness um, where you might do meditation or prayer or flotation. So it is a little bit involved, I guess, and today we're just going to work with the three core states. Um, and I also want to just say, be aware there's a whole nother model and theory that links to this called autonomic spacing that says that actually different body systems can be in different autonomic states at the same time. So if when you're watching a patient assessing for where they are on the autonomic ladder and something doesn't quite feel right or something doesn't quite fit easily into one of those, it may well be that they've got more than one state running at the same time. So I guess that leads in nicely to when we meet people, we want to be calibrating them to know what autonomic state they're in because it literally changes how we relate to them and what we do next. And we're gonna be watching their behaviors. Are they connecting with me? Have they got eye contact? Um, are they leaning forward in good rapport? Or you know, are they turned away, distracted on their phone maybe, or just unable to communicate with me? Now, of course, this all goes for you as practitioners as well to be aware of what state you're in, because just as they are picking up, um, you're picking up neuroception from them, they will from you as well. And if you are, albeit just slightly distracted when they walk in, the patient, especially if they're already hyper alert and triggered, the patient might then perceive that to be a threat when there, there wasn't one. Um, so we've got to be really cautious as practitioners, how we meet and greet, how we make our space safe for them, and be aware that, especially if there's a trauma background, they'll be hyper alert to any danger. Listen to their words as well. So there's a nice list of words on here. 
Um, if you're feeling, uh, if someone says they're feeling overwhelmed, it's a good, it's a good indication they've probably dropped into that mobilization um, state. Anyone that talks about being unsafe or disconnected connected or completely alone probably dropped into dorsal vagal so we're constantly watching for listening for to get a sense of where the patient's at so that we can meet them where they're at and then take them safely around the map um, one last bit as well is there are some and you will know this 10 times better than me there are some obvious uh, physical signs that you can look for as well that indicate whether or not they're in sympathetic or parasympathetic so both freeze and ventral vagal are both, both parasympathetic and sympathetic is in the middle of that um, the map. OK, let's jump in then. So let's think of a patient who arrives in stress. They're in some form of fight or flight response. They may have had a trauma history either recently or in the past, and they're probably then going to show up in the room in quite a wired way. I wonder how many of your patients turn up in that state? And maybe just make yourself a note um, and we'll go through each of the three and see if they add up basically. So what percentage of people come to you in what you would now know of as a sympathetic state, in that either fight or flight? They are gonna be more sensitive to risk. Their whole perception changes so how they see the world how they experience what's going on will be completely different and may well not match your perception of what's just happened even a neutral face to someone in that state can be seen as a threat and can push them further down the ladder so deliberately stopping connecting giving them a smile Having said that, if they're strongly down in that mobilization, like on the verge of going to withdrawal, and you give a beautiful, smiling, authentic face, if they don't know what to do with that and they don't know what it feels like, then even that can feel like a threat to them because it's too far away from what they know. So it is a bit of a dance when you're working with people with this in mind um, and really what you're hoping to do is certainly not push them any further down the ladder and if you can help to bring them back up um, because you want them making decisions from the top of the ladder uh, rather than at the bottom so we're going to gauge how far down the state um, that they're in because a little bit stressed and only just off ventral vagal is very different than someone who's been stressed for quite a long time or severely stressed and is close to going into collapse so if you could almost kind of um, subjectively score that, then it's really useful to know where you're at and how quickly you need to intervene. Um, as I say, if they're low down, they can very easily drop below that line to withdrawal or freeze or collapse. Um, and then it's much more difficult to, to be able to bring them up in a short time frame as an appointment. If they are higher up in that sympathetic level, you can you know, almost do the upsell of it can be a good thing. It can energize you. It can motivate you. It can tell you that something's not right and you need to do something about it. Um, Kelly McGonigal wrote a beautiful book called The Upside of Stress that I will often refer people to. OK, we certainly don't want to demonize it. It's not that it's wrong. Um, it, it sometimes there's very good reasons for going there, uh, but nor do we want to suppress it and not allow ourselves to feel it or for them to feel it. So giving them permission, um, letting them be real about expressing how they are feeling and that that's OK can be a great starting point. Listen for ways they might be numbing themselves out of feeling, so suppressing it, and that can come in a range of different ways, could be any of the addictions, drugs, alcohol, but it can also be social media. I have a client who is spending five hours a day on YouTube and he knows that he's doing that to numb out being able to feel um, shopping, being busy. So yeah, getting a real feel for what's going on around that might feel irrelevant, irrelevant but actually is key to understanding how they're managing um, the drop down the, the ladder. And they may not be aware that they're doing it, or they might be aware, but not feel that they've got a choice. One of the interesting questions I will ask at, at a sympathetic place is, 
can they still do quiet and stillness? Like, are they able to do that at any point in the day? Or even doing that, does it set off a stress response for them? I will often get them to score for themselves, just a subjective score out of 10. Where's your stress now? So that hopefully at the end of the session, we can rescore that. So having a stress meter, letting them have a stress meter to take away with them so that they can monitor themselves is a really good idea. And if they do go really low down and this easy drop into freeze and collapse, then really the best piece of advice I can give is to just slow down. Just slow down whatever it is you're doing and, and pace yourself against where they're at. And see if you can just hold them up into at least that stress response, if not get back up. I always ask how they manage things for themselves. At the moment, they may have some really great techniques that work. Why would I change that? So if they do, then great. We just encourage them to do that more. But for some people, they just don't know what they can do. They've never had the how to deal with that. Um, and so having a, a, a raft, I guess, of first aid tools up your sleeve can be really, really helpful. Um, Linking it in to uh, head-based anxiety, so that bottom left-hand corner, that, for anyone that recognises it, is Byron Katie's check on thinking, and it can be a really good, quick check on kind of that they're catastrophizing and going too far down that thinking line. So whatever it is they've just come out with, is it true? Now, most patients, if they're committed to that, will say, yes, of course it's true. I wouldn't have said it. You go, okay, so absolutely, how do you know it's true? What's your evidence for it? And then it can start to crumble. And how are you behaving because you're believing it's true? Um, and who would you be or what would you do otherwise if you didn't believe it's true? So it opens up conversation about something that might have felt very black and white. And I use that a lot. Some of my other favorite tools, Mark Warburton's Mindful Yawning. It's a really beautiful way of stopping mental anxiety or... Um, Andrew Huberman's physiological sigh with body-based stress. So just having some real key first aid tools that take seconds or minutes at most. If somebody is starting to drop down that ladder, that you can stop them dropping, basically. Constantly, you're looking at trying to create a safe place for them so that they, um, they can manage their own state, ideally. Okay, assuming life carries on, and it's still stressful, they will drop into dorsal vagal. And again, just what percentage of your patients arrive in dorsal vagal, that withdrawn? Um, and how do you connect with them if they are in that space? Because they're probably not able to connect with you facially. They may not even want to be in the room or the conversation. Uh, and how can you, big picture question, how can you? do all of that safely because they're already in a threat response so gentle rapport meeting them down there while you stay in ventral vagal and put a hand down to bring them up it is about safe mobilization to come up from that that being a hierarchy um, you can't jump straight back up to ventral vagal you've got to come through sympathetic so how can you safely mobilize somebody to get them up to sympathetic and be ready for the fact that that will bring the feelings up and some of those feelings may be very uncomfortable for them. So I thought with this one, I would just share with you a, a client that I have uh, fairly recently taken on and he's given me permission to share his beautiful artwork with him. You'll see that you don't need to be great artists to use this as a map. And what I've tried to do is just type around the words because some of them were quite difficult to um, read. So the type text it wasn't there on his map, um, but it helps you to read what it was. So he, I think this was at session three. Um, and at that point, he hadn't opened his eyes at all in a session with me. Uh, in terms of describing states to me, initially, there was no words. He couldn't describe them. And so I got out a sheet of paper. I'm also IDT trained. So I got out a sheet of paper and I just asked him to pick a color. What color best represents where you are right now? And he started at dorsal vagal. 
So you can see it's very black. There's that um, sad face. Um, I asked him to describe sympathetic verbally first for me, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, so we did a little bit of, of dorsal vagal, and then I, because he'd done the activity of the drawing, he was able to come up into sympathetic. And at sympathetic, he used words like terrified, sad. I felt it instantly. I was saying, remember a time when I feel it instantly. I'm overwhelmed, hopeless, frustrated. Sometimes I perceive everyone as a threat. Um, sorry for the language. He said, fuck this shit. Scream my head off in the gym. Doesn't like the sympathetic. So when he goes there, he drop, he will do anything he can to drop back into dorsal vagal. And Deb Starner has this beautiful phrase about home away from home. And absolutely his home away from home is in dorsal vagal. This is the person who's watching five hours of YouTube a day in order to numb himself out. And it stops him going into this mental catastrophizing and thinking. It literally numbs him out. And in dorsal vagal, his words are hopeless, never ending. I'm ashamed of myself for being there. I don't do bad shit. I'm a good person. So I'm upset. It's bleak. I'm so tired and confused. You can hear the hopelessness in even just the words as, as I'm saying. I asked him what it was like down there to describe it to me. And he said, I was on my way to my own execution, but I'm way past that now. I don't have a choice now. I'm in a cell. It's never going to get, I'm never going to get out. I'm alone. It's so dark. Like you would hear that language now and know for sure that he's down in dorsal vagal. I felt like an idiot all my life. And then the next bit for me that was a challenge was is that I don't expect this to work. I don't believe it will, which is that typical hopeless, helpless, powerless belief. So whatever I was going to offer at that stage, the chances are he's not going to do it because he doesn't believe it's going to work. He doesn't believe it can work. And so my job was really to get him up the ladder a little bit in order that I could even have a hope of him doing some of the interventions um, down at that bottom. He just wasn't going to wasn't going to go there. Ventral vagal initially couldn't go there at all. And then he did back a few years ago. He had a, a vibrant memory of a time when um, he, he said it was a spiritual event, incredible, happy, vibrant, blissful, elated, a sunset image. So I just got him to remember that so that he could describe ventral vagal for me. He wasn't comfortable staying there for very long at all. But interestingly, when he was describing that to me first time in three sessions, he actually looked at me and we I managed to have a little bit of humor and a laugh with him. And it was just lovely to see his face come alive and and to smile. And what it did was just bring him out of dorsal vagal enough that those feelings started to arise. So a deep sadness and a deep anger started to arrive. So we just managed those. So I hope it gives you a sense of how you can help people to feel into and understand what the three look like. And then what we did was say, well, OK, so how would you come up from if, you're, if this happens at home and you now know what it feels like, you know where you are. How would you bring yourself up from dorsal vagal upwards? And he came up with this list himself, which was beautiful, weightlifting, swimming, press ups and dancing. So remember, it's a, a safe mobilizer. So I've done the psycho ed with him. He then came up with those. And because he came up with them as options, hopefully he's much more likely to do them. If he's in sympathetic and wants to handle that uh, and regulate up again, Crying for him is a really key one, which is interesting, and we're still working on that and what it, the purpose behind it. But crying comes up for him, dancing, piano, um, listening to music, drawing, reading and meditation. So he's now got a little what we call a glimmers list of what he can do if he finds himself in one of those states when he's not with me and he's got some tools he can dip into. Uh, and then we talked about if if he was up the top, how he could stay. But that is such an alien place for him at the moment that he's yeah, he's just not there. OK, um, I will come back to him in a minute because I've now done four sessions with him and he's making eye contact with me um, and he's in a much, much better place. He's now his home and away from home is more sympathetic and we can work with that, whereas dorsal vagal is quite difficult to to work with. So the keys then 
to how you work with um, somebody who is in that withdrawn state, safe mobilization, pendulation so slowly pacing for the client a little bit of sympathetic and then they might go back a little bit of sympathetic and back um, making it okay giving them permission to be in dorsal vagal for a while it's okay you, you know it's there's nothing wrong with that they they can actually be healing and rest in that and if we can add in some mental vagal so it becomes safe stillness etc and um, absolutely with him the key has been to acknowledge and work with his individual neurological fingerprint. So me having a generalized plan or map, he will just reject it, anything, he'll just reject it. But if I talk to him about his unique individual neurological fingerprint and what would work for him, he then will come up with absolutely appropriate activities that he can do. So it's been beautiful, beautiful working with him. And as I say, um, Pleased to say that on his fourth session, he said to me, I now have some hope. I feel like maybe there's a way out. I don't know how yet, but maybe there's a way out. And he did most of that session with his eyes open. Um, he then met with friends in the week afterwards, which he hadn't done. He'd been out. He had felt feelings, which he hadn't done for a long while. He was uh, talking to his mum, whom he has a really good relationship with. And uh, yeah, we've just got him out of that stuck dorsal vagal, probably not for the whole week. I'm sure he still went back in there, but he now knows he can get out of it. OK, so we also have the top of the ladder. And the reason I do the top of the ladder last and I would do this with a patient or client as well is so that that's where I leave them. If you go down the ladder from ventral vagal, then you're leaving them in dorsal vagal potentially at the end. So I always start in sympathetic drop to dorsal vagal and then come up to that beautiful top of the ladder social connection. And if I'm honest, not many of my clients turn up in ventral vagal. Um, I'm hoping that a lot of them will leave knowing how to get there and being able to move flexibly around the ladder as life happens. So for yourselves, what percentage of your patients arrive in ventral vagal who are coming for maybe a health check-in rather than an um, ambulance at the bottom of the cliff? symptom where they've already they're already in a problem and if you look at those three figures then how many turn up in each of those have you does it add up to a hundred percent and if it doesn't what about all the others are they hard to categorize are they hard to um, calibrate it might be that they've got that auto, uh, autonomic sister um, autonomic spacing running where they're in mixed states or it might be they're in blended states uh, but it'd be good just to reflect on that for yourself. I guess once you're up in ventral vagal, the question is, how do you stay there? What can you do to keep yourself there and not be triggered down? So understanding what your triggers are. Um, and of course, ventral vagal is pulling down that sympathetic response. So um, we want to apply that ventral vagal break. And for you as the practitioner, probably one of the key areas in social connection is how can you stay there enough so that you can then co-regulate your patient regardless of where they've dropped to. So there's some there's some good insight and reflecting to be done at ventral vagal for yourself and patients. Um, one of the big questions I end up with patients uh, and clients is uh, fundamentally do they want to go there more? And if they do, are they willing to take what uh, do whatever it takes? And so sometimes they'll say they want it, but actually they're not really willing to do what it takes to, to get there or to stay there. OK, having not been following my notes, I am now not where I thought I was. All right. So um, I guess the other thing for yourselves in general practice is being realistic about what you can do within the time limit. I'm very lucky that I have at least an hour with my clients and I never book back to back. That's my business model. And so I will often spend up to two hours with a client in one session if they need that. And particularly in the early days, the first couple of sessions, they tend to be a little bit longer. Um, in 15 minutes, I would be certainly calibrating. I would be certainly looking at what I can do um, to help them move in that flexibility as much as possible because we want them making decisions back from the top as much as possible, not in those down beliefs where I can't make a difference. 
just thought I'd share this with you. This was one of my clients recently. He came to me, he's a coach and a trainer, and he had lost his sense of purpose and his fire, his, his pizzazz, he called it. He's got a military background um, initially and a, a professional rugby player. So I, I don't know, for me, I wasn't surprised he was then frustrated when he felt that he wasn't in line with that persona that he had had where he got things done and he was very effective. Um, he, in fact, he had stopped doing any keep fit. He'd stopped playing rugby. He said he was feeling sluggish and stuck. Generally, health-wise, he wasn't too bad, but he had gone to his GP twice with palpitations that worried him and it had set him off on a head-based anxiety. He was convinced he was going to be dying of a heart attack. When I first saw him, um, the biggest thing that came out for us was it was like there was two versions of him. So he described them as a courageous lion and a vulnerable child. And it was like this massive fight going on inside of him of where he actually was and where he thought he should be. So he felt like he wasn't living his true identity. And uh, he was he felt like he was running out of time to contribute something of worth. He had recently got married and he thought this was going to be this blissful, perfect life. And uh, he, he was kind of so stuck in the stuff that it was even getting in the way of this new marriage and the relationship. And there was definitely some anger arising because of that. So we spoke to, spoke to got to know, brought the two parts into the room, um, straight NLP tool, but quickly took him to his autonomic map to understand what was going on. And one of those parts was in dorsal vagal, the other one was in sympathetic. So we started to work cheekily really, how can they work together? How can they talk to each other? And this was the resulting map that we came up with. And you can see that those parts had intertwined up in the middle. He was pretty much glowing now. Um, he, absolutely felt safe to go and explore his business to to kind of pivot his business uh, one of the things I did in the session and in tasking outside was to literally get his body moving again so that he could embody this fully and he could just feel what he called the electric current starting to go through him which is that autonomic um, system firing up so this image came after two sessions with him. So this stuff doesn't take long once they uh, can really understand and feel into their own bodies. And uh, I'm sure you can see how for somebody who's not looking at an urgent health benefit, there's a different way of using um, the polyvagal ladder really. As I say, we haven't even begun looking at the adaptations, the peas and the pleas or the feigning, and we haven't got time to do that today. Um, but I do encourage you to go away and play with that and reflect on it. And how would you how would you do it? For me, if if I was going to say what are the key takeaways that I hope you've um, taken on? And it is it's a huge amount to cover in 45 minutes. Thank you for staying with me. The first one would be that we do all have our own unique neurological fingerprint. So no one has exactly the same um, setup in wiring or development or growth learning and trauma history. And so we have to work with each individual as an individual person and work with their system. Any model I use is only a heuristic. It's not prescriptive. And the skill, I guess, comes in that beautiful dance between my nervous system and their nervous system meeting each other and finding out where they are and how I can help them to um, to move on. There is a huge focus at the moment on trauma in literature, in therapy. I'm sure there is in general practice as well. And uh, that impact that it has on our base state, that home away from home that Deb Dana talks about. So, you know, right down to whether or not neurons even develop properly, whether they're myelinated and how trauma literally changes how we perceive the world, our phenomenology. So fundamentally, it's there to keep us safe. Our nervous system, it's not too worried about whether you're happy or whether you're ethical. It's just keeping you alive and letting people understand how that's working and driving behaviors can be really useful. And for us being trauma informed so we don't re-traumatize someone inadvertently. For the patient, for my clients, it starts with awareness. Have they got the ability, that interoceptive ability to actually identify where they're at? And that's where those maps can be really useful. 
even if it is just what color are each of those states what does it feel like what are you aware of there um, it's a, it can be a really good entry point into that awareness once they are aware giving them an understanding the psychoeducation about what's going on the fact that it is normal neurology um, and uh, yeah working with them at the pace they can go working with triggers so what is it that drops you down so that you can be aware of it quicker and make a choice quicker about whether or not you drop or whether or not you actually intervene before you drop can be really useful. And then what I talked about in terms of those glimmers, how do you come back up and how you come up from dorsal vagal is very different from how you come up from sympathetic. So amplifying those glimmers so that they can regulate their state and move flexibly around. If there was one message, I guess, I'd love you to take away from this, it's um, to hold in your, your whole frame of reference around the body and nervous system, that it is a system, a complex, dynamic, ever-changing system, and that we're recalibrating moment to moment, that it isn't just about a head brain directing everything, that we actually have body intelligence and, and body control to some extent of what's happening. So again, I don't fit in a box and um yeah that that can be a whole new way of looking at things so my key message to you as you walk away is to hear and witness the patient wherever they are at and let the patient feel that that's okay where they're at in that moment remind them they have more power and choice than they think they have um, and just giving back some hope and control to them by teaching them how to work with glimmers and triggers and of course, you all do this naturally anyway, showing them that you truly care so that they get that sense of safety and being seen and heard without that, they're not going to come back up that ladder. And in parallel to all of that, doing all of that for yourself as well. Healthcare is a, a difficult place to work, as we all know, um, and we also need to be monitoring our own systems and our own triggers and our own glimmers and making sure that we stay healthy and spend as much time as we want at that top. So thank you so much for signing up for tonight, for coming along. I hope I've raised your awareness a little bit about ANS in general practice. I'm sure I've set up more questions than I have answered. Um, so, of course, I'm happy to take questions and I'm also happy if you want to get in touch with me after today, then feel free absolutely to reach out. Um, but yeah, Bruce, any questions coming in through the chat box? Yep, no, we've got a number of questions. I've answered a few. Uh, somebody asked me for a simple document and what we'll put up is Deb Dana's Beginner's Guide, which Beautiful. is a six page document, which will go over what Suzanne's talk up with a picture of the ladder. Uh, somebody else asked about a diagram, and I mentioned the flip chart, Deb Dana's flip chart, which I know you use and I use, have a copy. It's a cardboard flip chart, and it has the... I meet you. Do you want to see it? Okay, okay. Let me get rid of my background, and then you will... Okay. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a lovely chart to use with patients because while they're looking at that and you're explaining, <coughs> in the back you have key explanation points, so you don't even have to remember what you're saying to them, and there's there's a whole load of different ones. The glimmers are there, the triggers are there. It's well worth like five dollars from Fish Pond. So um, so that's it. So the questions are rocketing in now. Question actually about um, ADHD. Do you take referrals? And I think one of the things you do, Suzanne, is sometimes talk to people before you do you accept. I always talk. Yeah, I always talk to somebody first, partly because we know the biggest variable in therapy is the relationship with the therapist, basically. So I will always talk to somebody first to see whether or not they they kind of can get into rapport with me, whether I feel that I can do something to help them, whether they feel I'm the right person. And then we usually meet once, have one session at the end of which we go, OK, is this helpful? Do you think it might be helpful? Do you want to book a package or do you just want to walk away and, you know, I'm not the right person for you or I might refer them to someone else? Um, so I, I, very, I, I would say I never take someone straight in at a long package of coaching without having given them the chance to really assess me get to know me and feel that they're going to be safe with me for all the reasons we talk about on polyvagal 
So a question of how can we be trained in this further? What would you suggest? Um, well, I trained directly with Deb Dana, and I was very lucky that in COVID, when we were in lockdown, she did a course online based in Australian Times. So um, it was very easy to attend and I did a, I think it was a four years course and it was excellent. Um, I do offer some polyvagal uh, training with you, Bruce, and also through Grow. So the next ones of those are coming up in July. That's grow.co.nz, um, grow.co.nz, they run polyvagal. We're going to have Deb Dana next year. She's coming to Australia. We'll bring her over to New Zealand and we're planning on probably doing a free webinar. So she'll be based in Auckland, but it will be broadcast nationally. So we're hoping those of you who are in Tiana or the Catlins will be able to uh, to tune in. So we're not going to make it Auckland only. So um, yeah, and what, what, other courses do you run, Mother, what other courses do you run? You run the, the embraining ones, which is a variation. Yeah, I do. I run an embraining course which teaches people to have communication and coach through the multiple brains rather than just head based. Um, I run a number of communication courses, stress reduction courses. So uh, kind of within that wider field of helping people, I guess, get some control back in their lives. That's where the focus is at, whether it's through stress or whether it's through coaching. Um, how, do, how do they get take back control? I think we, we have the, the, the great Tony Fernando asking a question here. What are the common glimmer interventions? Well, from the bottom, it's anything. So from dorsal vagal, it's anything that's a safe stressor. So it might be something as simple as taking someone out for a walk. Or if you're in a room, getting them to stand up. If they're completely dissociated, it might be something as simple as, if you can still hear me, will you blink or you know move your fingers? So it's a safe stressor, depending how far down you are, the, the level of movement will change. So just like my lovely guy, he did weightlifting and dancing, um, that way they were his. Once you're in a mobilized state, then to move up from that, you're looking really at calming the system and relaxing. So any of your breathing techniques, mindfulness, self-havening, um, yes, yeah, 101 humming, rocking, floating. So for me, it's about what does the client like doing so that I can make those as easy as possible for them. There's no point me giving them a list of stuff they'd never do in a month of Sundays. But after I've educated them about the sort of thing we're looking for, then they come up with the bits that they like. Again, it might be walking, it might be listening to a more relaxed form of music, whereas from dorsal vagal, the music you want to it's up, get you up moving music at sympathetic up to it's more relaxation move uh, music, meditation. Um. So I've got a bunch of questions here. Um, one was, how do functional seizures with a loss of consciousness and tachycardia, 170 beats per minute, fit with polyvagal theory of collapse, which is usually associated with bradycardia. So my, um, I'm not a medical doctor, right? So um, I will give my opinion and then you need to go and check it out. But my hunch would be that you're looking at a mixed autonomic spacing issue where part of the body has gone into sympathetic and then part of the body has gone into dorsal vagal so if you've gone unconscious your body's gone into collapse withdrawal but your cardiac system is still in a mobilized state would be my guess well presumably if, if you're so so sympathetically driven you're going to um, have poor blood supply because the um you know that, that might be driving the unconsciousness yeah you know, excessive sympathetic it's dysregulation in one way or the other isn't it absolutely use absolutely. the lingo that's the lingo you want to go with Dysregulation of your sympathetic nervous system is yeah. the jargon. Now we've got 20 questions here. Yeah. Wondering if you use sensory modulation in your practice alongside talk therapy. Yeah, okay. absolutely. It, it weaves in a complementary way. Um, it comes up often in, it's not something I'm trained in, but I've gone and looked up the basics and I think it's absolutely complementary too. And you could use that alongside, yeah. Interesting here. I'm interested in your opinion on the concept that it is unsafe to guide trauma clients and grounding type exercises 
as their own bodies feel unsafe? I think it's a pacing issue for me. So many of my clients come with trauma and I'm certainly not going to jump straight in to that. I need to build a safe platform so that and also create um, somewhere to come back to so that if they get triggered, I can bring them back into a safe grounded moment so for me that's a pacing issue so what do you do if somebody does get triggered how do you bring them back into a safe um what's your strategy there so it depends where they've gone if they've gone into a stress response i might get them up and do a breathing technique a hard breathing or you know line breathing it's sometimes called i might get them to do a physiological side if they've dropped into a dissociated place then effectively I'll go and meet them there and sit with them for a moment and then do that really gentle, okay, let's just raise a hand. Let's just bring you back into the present moment. Can you feel the chair beneath you? Can you hear whatever I'm hearing in the room? Could you just demonstrate a physiological sigh? I just did a gem about it a few a month or so ago. Yeah. Uh, the, the sigh was a double intake breath with a long sigh out through the mouth. Yeah, so it's a big breath in through the nose so that you think your lungs are full. And then when you think they're full, you suck an extra bit in. So it's. And you're allowed to make a noise when you breathe out. Absolutely. <laughs> and I would always do that with my client. I'd never get them to do that on their own because there's a little bit of like almost performance issue there. I'd always do it with them, always give them free will to do it however they like. So there's no right or wrong. Um, two of those really good um, way of just settling and, and breaking that neurological pattern so that you reset the nervous system. Yes, yeah, so I, I had a gym on that and box breath. I'm box breathing a little bit easier to explain to patients, but it's probably not as good as the sigh breathing, according to this article. And box. So, yeah, we haven't got time tonight, but box breathing, you're often told four, 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 four. But actually, the four needs to be moderated depending on your CO2 tolerance. So for some people, four won't work. Uh, can someone fake being in ventral vagal to cover up their feelings of being in dorsal vagal? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's where your beautiful intuition and neuroception skills will come in because you'll get a hint that it's not it's not quite as rosy as they're trying to make out that it is. You'll feel it. Well, that's what uh, Robin Williams used to say. Well, people don't fake depression, they fake being normal, <laughs> which I think is. Yeah. Um, you just like to say something about the dorsal break, the advantage of slow breathing in terms of the heart rate variability getting uh, improving. Well, the quickest way I say to my patients to relax is to breathe slowly. Sorry. Most of us breathe too fast and most of us breathe too much. So we're taking in too much volume of air and we're often um, high in the chest, which fires up more sympathetic nerve fibers. So slowing the breath down, if you want to, the, the quickest kind of vagal break is an even breath. So five or six in, five or six out, five or six in, five or six out, no holds. And that's the quickest way to get back into what we call coherence high heart rate variability and that's turning literally turning the sympathetic response off putting the vagal break on so that you bring your system back well, i have a technique which i use with asthmatics is gentle cpr i stand beside people say is it okay to put my hand on your chest and then just i can then control their breathing rate and i think the hands-on helps so long as they're feeling safe yeah and um yeah. uh you know you get their permission and um, it really settles the asthmatics down who are all hyperventilating, yeah. uh, whether it's the asthma or just their, their fear of, um, of, of things. Like yeah, that. the other thing I'll sometimes do is the Tom Granger drawing it. So either getting a pen on paper and drawing it, which just really focuses mindfully on that breath or doing it with a finger in front of you. Um, and if you're doing that with them, of course, they're visually watching you and you're pacing it for them. So there's, yeah, there's, there's gentle prompts you can use to guide people into a slower breath. Um, somebody asked, do you do supervision for therapists? And I said, I'm sure you would. Uh, you <laughs> I want. do, yeah, I do. Um, 
Uh, do you work with people on the ASD spectrum? How well is this suited? Yeah, it's not my area of particular expertise, um, but I have got a couple of people that I've worked with um, for the anxiety link. Rather than working with the full spectrum, I will work with them to teach them how to manage the anxiety, which is a, is a big issue for them. Um, is there any way to stimulate the vagus nerve? I was thinking of the auditory stuff. Yeah, lots and lots of ways. Humming, rocking, gargling, singing, uh, some of the breathing. So any of the breathing that goes into the bottom of the lungs without force, that will stimulate vagus. Um, gratitude is another good one. Self-hating. The Polyvagal Institute has a link to the, there's an auditory thing you can stick in your ears and it pumps in uh, safe sounds into your ears and that supposedly calms your, um, it's, a, it's a commercial product developed by Stephen Forges, but now under the control of somebody else. The Safe and Sound Protocol. Safe and Sound Protocol. Some people in Christchurch, I think, use it, don't they? Yeah, um, I've um, I've played with that. It's very good. It's um, you you listen and you th you can't even work out how they've changed the music. Mm. Um, but uh, you know, if you because there's there's an expense with that. So listening, having I get all my clients to create a playlist. What's your playlist for coming up out of dorsal vagal? What's your playlist for coming out of sympathetic? And what's your playlist for being in ventral and staying there? And I get them to have those three playlists. So they just pick their own songs, individual network again. What songs do it for them? And if it does it for them, that's fine. So we're more and more doing telephone consultations. Any suggestions, tips for how we can do telehealth um, using polyvagal uh, stuff? Yeah, I think you. it's about working a bit extra hard to get that sense of safety because they're not going to get the that kind of voice face heart circuit stuff, the, the real sense of human connection, eye to eye, smile to smile. So being really conscious of tone of voice, using some of the heart coherence, which if you look at the latest heart math work through quantum measure, um, they would say that, that you'd pick that up by feeling even though you're not anywhere near them. So I think it's about working a little bit extra hard initially and being conscious of how do I create that safety when I'm not there with them to give the human safety connection that would normally drive it. Asking them what they want as well. So, you know, autonomy and agency is a core part of safety. And the other big safety marker for the autonomic nervous system is choice. So giving the patient choice rather than just telling them to do this, that would be another way of creating safety. Um, Carl has mentioned uh, ice baths are apparently quite good. <laughs> yeah, not everybody likes it. Um, I would start probably a little bit softer than that with a, either a start or an end of a shower cold or even sometimes in the room, um, just a cold flannel. So a gentle version of the ice bath. You've got to work up to the ice bath, really. You've really got to work on your breathing to be able to do that. It's great, um, but I don't know that I'd do it in a first aid -y type situation. But when you do, you, what you're doing is instigating that mammalian dive reflex. You can drop their pulse by 15 to 20 in a moment. Mm. So it's powerful. But you, again, it's pacing, doing it safely. So Rita's asked for some scientific evidence. I think if you look up Stephen Porges on Google, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of articles. He's been working on it for 30 years. Yeah. Uh, he got interested in it actually in neonates because when neonates get sick, they get a bradycardia. And he was trying to figure out why would the vagus nerve kill you? And um, that's how and then he discovered there's this primitive part of the dors the dorsal vagus, the unmyelinated lower part. That's the bit that's that's operating when you're under severe stress. Yeah. So a very sick neonate um, is bradycardic because it's under severe. It's shutting down, basically. Yeah. yeah. So, All yeah. of his work has been published along the way. Deb's done some beautiful work as well around clinical write up of case studies and research so looking up either of their names you'll you'll come up with lots of um good quality research evidence yep 
Uh, what about tapping? Tapping. Um, I'm not qualified in tapping. It's got a good reputation. It's got some good research behind it. Um, havening, which I am qualified in, comes out of the tapping background. So the guys that developed havening kind of came across tapping and then said, how is that working? They're both medical doctors, um, one of them at Harvard. And he went and did all the research of what is the biology that's happening behind that and discovered that you can do the same thing through self-havening. So yeah, any of those psychosensory touch techniques are, I think, working directly with the autonomic nervous system, even though some of them talk about they're only working in the amygdala connection. I think they're doing more than that. Well, I heard uh, uh, Van der Kolk saying he thinks the EMDR works because it reminds us of being on the plains of Africa, scanning. In left and right, yeah. When you're scanning, you're in a safe place. Uh, yeah. when, when, the, when the lion's in front of you, you won't be scanning. You're only scanning when you're in a safe place. So um, um, do you know when neuroception develops in utero? What's when a sense of danger can be perceived in utero? And oh, it's a great question. And I don't for sure, but I do know that the myelination happens within um, the last trimester. So as soon as you're going myelination, you're talking that ventral vagal, the final kind of development component. So my guess would be that it's in the last trimester in line with that myelination process. And then that goes on for, you know, up to 18 months after they're born. This may be a stretch, but can you explain how Qigong and acupuncture relate to polyvagal theory? Oh, gosh, no, not easily in a quick question. <laughs> I or think Qigong is using, you know, it's using the, um, the physical movement is really important. Like, we so we're getting so sedentary in our lifestyles and sitting at computers or sitting at desks. So Qigong is a beautiful way of bringing in controlled movement, as is yoga, that will automatically speak to the autonomic nervous system. Um, so Liz, Liz is asking about where psychotropic medicines fit in with the polyvagal theory, especially antidepressants that are com com commonly given in GP for sympathetic and DV stages. Yeah, there's a, a, a wealth of studies coming out at the moment about psychedelics with some good studies. Um, I don't know enough about it myself. I know Gabor Mate has gone and played with it in order to do research around it and understand it. So you might want to search him and psychedelics or just... Or psychotropics like antidepressants, sorry. Psychotropics, sorry. Oh. I thought you were talking the psychedelics. Yeah. Great conversation to be had there as well. Yeah. Uh, so well, the, the problem I... with... Uh, abbreviation IDT was that one you used uh, Inter interactive drawing therapy okay yeah okay yeah. getting people to express on paper so what comes out is their subconscious and it goes quite deep quite quickly quickly when you put it on paper a uh, question about the havening technique in relation to polyvagal theory and autonomic ladder well, I my perception is, and I've um, sent questions into Ronald Rudin about this, and he agreed with me, although it's not what is taught as standard, is that you're not just working with the synapses at the amygdala. You are going to be impacting the synapses across the whole body. And the AMPA receptors are not just at the amygdala junction. They're at any of the synapses. So I think my personal perspective is that you are working with the whole autonomic nervous system when you're doing self-havening and when you're doing havening on someone else. Um, and I think that's partly why it's so effective. Yeah, and I guess it allows people to then to be feeling safe in the presence of a trauma memory. Um, yeah, the, I guess the issue would be if you haven't built the safe relationship and then you go to haven someone else, you could trigger them into a, a an unsafe response, a threat response. Yeah, there's also the option of people doing the havening themselves rather than absolutely. If, if, you, if you don't want to touch your your yeah. patients, you can do yeah. that. Um, so yeah, okay, we've answered one here. Um, I, I really like the forceful loud breath that you demonstrated at the Good Fellow Conference. Was that dorsal or sympathetic? The har breath. The, the uh, loud breath, the, 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 um, the sigh breath. Oh, the physiological sigh is effectively um, putting a fast vagal break on. And then after I've done that physiological sigh, I would bring them into the even balanced breathing to keep them there to, because 
your heart rate variability, it can take a few minutes for that to change. Mm. But if someone's in a distressed state and you try and take them into even balanced breathing, it's too big a leap. So the physiological side kind of brings them in from the edge a bit and then you do balance. Um, so it's, it's definitely calming down that stress response by uh, going straight in at the nervous system level. How did you become qualified to use IBT? There's, um, I went and trained. I did some of my training in Palmerston North and the more advanced stuff I did in Wellington. So there's a few trainers in New Zealand. It's a New Zealand model. Oh, okay. Wow. Made in New Zealand. Wow. Um, yeah. Do you use hypnosis to move between states? Um, she says, smiling. Yes, probably. I am hypnosis trained. I don't do um, clinical hypnosis in isolation, but it's almost like you can't not because all hypnosis is, is altering a state. So even by a changed tone of voice, I'm going to alter somebody's state. By careful use of language, I'm going to alter state. So absolutely, I'm sure I do. Am I consciously using hypnosis? No. Yes, it's hard to know what is hypnotic, isn't it? You know, it's like um, the worst is over uh, is a uh, is a hypnotic statement in a sense, isn't it? So, I mean, yeah. it's the language, the, the uh, passive voice. So we're just about out of uh, out of time. So is there just a final statement? What's the take home message for you? Uh, I think just the fact that you've been here and listened to this, it will now be in your reticular activating system. So you'll be more alert to it and looking for it. My takeaway would be feel into where the patient's at and change how you speak to them and what you do determined by what state you have calibrated them to be in. Because, I mean, this stuff is going on all the time automatically. The time. You arrive, arrive at a party with your smile on and people will feel warm. You come in with a grouchy look on your face and nobody will talk to you. Yeah. Um, Sabrina. Well, Suzanne, thank you very much. Um, My absolute uh, pleasure. Anyway, so over and out from us, Suzanne, and thank you very much to the uh, huge audience we've had tonight. So, Thank you so much. Okay, good night.